side. What do you think of the Texas blackouts? I mean, what we're seeing more and more is that the left are jumping up and down saying, oh, no, it's not wind power. It's not solar power. It's, uh, well, something else. Well, what do you think? Was wind and solar a major contributor to the Texas blackout? Wind and solar was the primary contributor. Uh, they've, the left in Texas has done a terrific job in trying to take the focus off of wind and solar and say, oh, we were short of natural gas. Well, you need natural gas on every part of the grid and every utility to uh, support wind and solar, you know, when the wind stops blowing and the sun stops shining. And, of course, that happened big time throughout Texas. So they've really done a, a very good job of telling lie after lie to take the focus off wind and solar. But it's entirely wind and solar. And that will that's the beginning of the blackouts. We are going to see uh, an increase in blackouts across the nation as more and more electric utilities uh, buy into increasing the amount of wind and solar they have. Because uh, 100% of the wind and solar that any utility has must be backed up 100% or near 100% by fossil fuel power, uh, running at the ready, essentially running 100 percent at the ready when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine. And so the more we have, uh, the more blackouts and brownouts we're going to have all across the nation. And we don't need a, a sol- uh, you know, a polar vortex in Texas to create it. It's going to be just normal, everyday operation of electric grids, which are going to have Uh, blackouts and brownouts when uh, the so-called renewable energy, which you and I know are really unreliable. We got to stop calling them renewables and call them unreliable because that's what they are. But the uh, the left has done a good job of taking uh, all of the blame, not much of the blame off wind and solar, when essentially all of the blame belongs there. Well, yeah, and Sterling Burnett, Dr. Burnett from the Heartland Institute, he was pointing out that before the storm hit, There was a period just a few hours earlier where the wind and solar power were actually providing more than half of Texas's electricity. And then as the storm was coming in, it dropped to about zero, almost like almost immediately. So, I mean, how does a grid stay stable if one of the major uh, contributors to the electricity goes from around half to nothing just overnight, practically? Well, it cannot stay stable. And, and, it doesn't just have to happen overnight. It can happen, you know, within minutes. But most people don't understand the grid. And it's uh, it, you get into the weeds with electrical engineering. But uh, on an on a electric grid, the supply must equal demand all the time. It must equal demand all the time. And when, uh, when supply becomes less than demand, uh, the, the grid has to shut down. Well, most utilities are prepared for that to happen by having arrangements with big electric users uh, not to supply them with as much electricity in, in a certain time as they did previously, or they have agreements that say when these things happen, we're going to black out a certain community and, and then we'll move the blackout from area to area. So they are prepared for it. Well, when, when it happens as dramatically as it did in Texas, no one was prepared. And one can argue that the worst part of it was that the uh, Texas grid was not well managed. Oh, yeah. Uh, while, you know, they don't expect this tremendous, huge weather change we had, but they should. These things happen. They may happen every five years or every 10 years, but you've got to be prepared for them because they create disaster. It could have been a lot worse, frankly. Yeah, apparently uh, they could have gotten. They could have lost the whole state. Without a doubt. And, and, When things really go bad, transformers blow up. I mean, equipment is destroyed if if it's not fed the uh, amount of electricity uh, it needs to stay balanced. So it could have been a lot worse, as bad as it was, but it it was not properly managed. And part of that is the reliance on wind and solar, which you you have to know is undependable. Yeah. And, And, you know, it's funny because Biden then shipped diesel generators to Texas. So the net result of having so much wind and solar was an increase in pollution. You know, it's also interesting that um, Joe Biden and Trudeau, who seem to be real buddies, they've promised to work together towards net zero by 50. Well, 
if you ever were to achieve that, surely that would mean turning off your most abundant and reliable source of power, namely fossil fuels. Yeah, they, they know it isn't possible. <clears throat> Again, it's, it's a power grab. And of course, when, when Biden, uh, when they talk about 2050, I just laugh because they're not going to be around <laughs> in yeah, 2050. Exactly. I mean, for the, yeah, for the most part, uh, Biden's only going to be around effectively for two year, years. When he no longer has the House and Senate, there's, there's much less that he can accomplish. And certainly he's going to be gone in, uh, in, in four years uh, for reasons I don't understand. Trudeau has managed uh, to stay on in Canada despite uh, major scandals. Uh, I don't know. Do people in Canada want socialism and, and a poor well, government to uh, more than the United States? I don't know. I think the problem is our our opposition are ineffective. Uh, you know, basically, they, they strive as hard as they can. They're supposedly conservatives, and they often get a leader that pushes them more and more towards the left. And, of course, if you really want to vote for a liberal, you vote for a liberal. You don't vote for a conservative who has liberal tendencies. So, yeah, in Canada, we are continuing with Trudeau, largely because our opposition are ineffective. <laughs> you know, the other well, that- thing... The other thing, of course, that that's true in the United States. That's absolutely true in the United States too. Yeah, the the, the, the right is very ineffective. Yeah, we call them we call them a red Tories in Canada. I've heard the term rhino in the United States. What does that stand for? That stands for Republican in name only. R I N O. And we have a lot of them. Uh, they they really the the major ones showed their stripes when they voted to impeach. Uh, uh, Trump and and you can see how they vote uh, on all kinds of liberal things. They're they're I would say between nine and twelve uh, Republican senators that are Republican in uh, name only. They uh, for why they ran as Republicans, I guess they thought they could win in their particular area. But the conservatives are uh, there's something about conservatives where they look out for themselves. They they have their own personal agenda. The left works together, uh, hand in glove. You watch any Sunday television show, go from one show to the other, and it's the same talking points. I mean, oh, yeah? The whole party and everybody in it, they get their marching orders every day, and, and they never vary. And the reason they never vary is the, the top guy in the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer, he controls all the committee assignments. If you get out of line as a uh, as a democratic senator and vote the wrong way you lose your committee assignment so the the head has a a, a lot of power and it, it's really very sad but i'm very optimistic because this will not be the case initially for new people running for the senate and house because they're going to run on the miserable things that biden will have done to the american public yeah. so they'll be good at least at the beginning now Washington seems to co-opt everyone that goes there. So I can't say how the new Republicans who will be elected in the House and the Senate will be, you know, a few years down the road. But I can tell you that every one of them that's running are going to be the kind of conservative Republicans we want to see. Yeah. You know, over the last few months, I've listened to a book called Rules for Radical Conservatives on Audible, and it's really quite extraordinary. And it strikes me after listening to the 25 hours or so of that book that liberals fight to win, and they are ruthless. They will do practically anything to win, whereas conservatives fight, in many cases, simply to appear to be fighting to win. They're not I don't find that, I mean, there are some conservatives, of course, that are principled and hard fighters, but I find that many of them are, are really kind of soft, you know, like they, they only fight to a certain extent. They don't actually fight hard to win. Is that something that you gather as well? Oh, absolutely. I would say you've described 70% of them uh, anyway. They, they, they fight to get a seat in Washington, get a big salary and a lot of power and, and prestige, and, and in terms of feeling for the conservative principles for our Constitution, uh, that, that takes a back seat. And, of course, I suppose when they're running, they, they probably show a false facade. But uh, eventually they show your, their stripes, which is exactly what you said. And, of course, that book is, is the opposite of the famous rules for radicals, which is the playbook for, for all the liberals. But I have maybe somewhat of a unique and and, and strident view of the the liberals and the progressives as well. 
uh, I think a significant one of a portion of them are really evil. I mean, these are really not good people. They they don't have morals. Uh, they can lie daily and, and never be bothered with it. I mean, they're a different kind of individual, and you you don't find them on the conservative side. You you find the soft, weak people you described, but you really don't find uh, the evil that that I see in a very significant percentage of progressives. People would say, "Oh, I've I've gone too far." I don't think so. Well, yeah, uh, I've worked in. Yeah, that's interesting you say that, because in that book, Rules for Radical Conservatives, and I can't, you know, emphasize it more more, more than I am. I mean, it's really sensational. They say one of the troubles is that conservatives actually have a moral compass, and they feel, you know, restricted by what they can do to achieve their objectives because they're religious, because they believe in basic honesty and standards like that, whereas so many on the left are agnostic or atheist, they basically don't have the same kind of moral restrictions that people on the right feel. And that when it comes to actual direct hand-to-hand combat, that's actually a bit of a liability for the right, because they are concerned about not being too hard and not really coming across in, in a way that is too hard on their opponents, whereas the left are, I mean, look at Tim Ball, I mean, good grief, you know, he's being creamed by them in court, you know, and essentially they they want us to die i mean i find that the um the morals are just not there on the left they'll attack anybody uh, anytime viciously with lies etc and this is all okay because it achieves their goal but i don't find i find the right are are governed more by basic moral standards do you think that's unrealistic uh tom i could never say it as eloquently as uh, you have just said and the, the one line that I say over and over again that describes everything you just said is, to the left, the end justifies the means. The yeah. end justifies the means. So they can lie and cheat, do anything they choose to get their socialist mandate goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, eh, because they're constantly <laughs> saying that they're social justice warriors, and yet their policies are more damaging to the poor in our society than anybody. So, I mean, it told, you know, many of the causes that the left say they hold dear, they violate by their own actions. Um, you know, and, and I think that the leaders in the movement know that. I think most of them, a lot of them, are just simply naive. You know, like I, I have a sister who's very socialist, nice person. But at the same time, I don't think she understands the implications of socialism. And, and you're saying that also is very much the case with the young people. Yeah, exactly. That's certainly the case uh, in the United States. They, there is a huge group that is naive and, and does not understand. But there's a bigger group uh, that, you know, at least the leadership, the central core of the progressives, they know exactly what they're doing. And one of their tricks, and I'm sure it is in the, <clears throat> the book Rules for uh, Conservatives, uh, is that they foist their evilness onto their opponents. In other words, the things that they are doing underhanded, they claim the opposition are doing. And by doing that, they take the focus off their evil ways. Yeah. So they're lying and cheating, and they tell the opposition they're lying and cheating. And basically... Everything they accused Trump of in a negative way were their their everyday operation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because in this book, Rules for Radical Conservatives, um, they actually trace out the history as to how progressives left is, I mean, they're not really progressive. In many cases, they're totally intolerant of alternative points of view. So I wouldn't call that progressive. But regardless, it, it talks about how the left took over our institutions. You know, the long march of the institutions, our schools, our churches, our universities, our uh, government, our media. And they conclude in this book that it's going to be a hard, long, very tense, very intense fight to win back America and to win back Canada and all the Western democracies. So it sounds like you agree that this is going to be a pretty tough battle. And if conservatives don't become more realistic and and more dis, more um, definitive and and not afraid, that we will never get the country back. Well, I'm not that pessimistic, uh, but what I, I think what you're, you're, you're missing is that we are in a battle of good versus evil. 
and the world has been in a battle of good versus evil forever. Uh, I, whatever you.